This is Ham College, Episode 65, for May 31st, 2020. Ham College is brought to you by ICOM and the new revolutionary IC705 with optional multifunction backpack. And by hamstudy.org, a great way to study for your next amateur license exam. Good evening and welcome to another action-packed episode of Ham College. I'm Professor Thomas. And I'm Dean Martin. And we've got a show tonight, like we usually do when we get together here. It's really a class, and (laughs) there's usually a pop quiz every time around. As a matter of fact, that's mostly what it is, and we're going to do that tonight. We're going to do a little splaining and... We're back into the extra exam pool. You know, last month we uh, we had planned to do the extra exam pool, but we we kind of got distracted because we had a special guest on, and it was so interesting that we just had to keep going. What did we talk about? Who did you have here uh, in the dorm last? Oh, last we had time? Richard from uh, HamStudy.org on here. And uh, yeah, it was it was very interesting. It was only supposed to last about ten minutes, and I think he actually got wrapped up in it too. I, mean, I was going to try to cut him off at ten minutes because he said he had to go, but but uh, l- luckily for us, he kept going, and uh, we found out a lot about the remote testing that's going on now with the uh, COVID nineteen virus stuff and people kind of locked in and social distancing. There've been a lot of changes in that area, and uh, quite a few. Apparently, quite a few test, uh, remote testing sessions have been going on. And anyway, he's kind of up in the middle of all that. So it's really interesting to find out a lot of those details. It was, yeah. It was some really good information. And I suspect it's it's progressed even further since uh, we spoke with him at, uh, well, at the end of this past um, month. I imagine so. I know he was working really hard on it and uh, mm-hmm. obviously has been for a while and and probably still will be for a good while. But uh, it's pretty cool stuff. It's ground, kind of groundbreaking and uh, a pretty big change for our hobby. It is. It really is. Well, there's something we always talk about at the very first of each live stream. What is that? Going to the Magic Kingdom. Other than that, we talk about the chat room. Uh, if you're... I was kidding. I knew what you, I knew where you were going with that. Just trying to throw you a curve. <laughs> sure, sure, you did. I, I did. Um, anyway, uh, if you're watching the live stream, you should join us in the chat room, uh, amateurlogic.tv forward slash chat. If you're missing, if you're not in the chat room and you're watching the live stream, you're missing half the fun. The question is, which half? I I'm guess not. that's up to you. Yeah. What do you say we get on into some questions here and let the chips fall where they may? Okay. Well, I hope, hope Chip stays upright. The end of- he, yeah, there's Chip. He's in there. Yeah, he's in there. So don't fall, Chip. Uh, he wants to know where Mike is. You know, that's a good question. We might have to send him a tardy slip. That is a good question. All right, well, let's flip the old virtual coin and see who gets the first question. All right. Okay. All right, I'll take it. Okay. (laughs) How was that? Uh, That works for me, so am I asking or are you asking? Yeah, you ask, and I'll, I'll answer the first one. Okay. How does the control operator responsibilities of a station under automatic control differ from one under local control? A, under local control, there is no control operator. 
B, under automatic control, the control operator is not required to be present at the control point. C, under automatic control, there is no control operator. Or D, under local control, a control operator is not required to be present at a control point. That's interesting. Uh, okay. How do the control operator responsibilities of a session under automatic control differ from one under local control? Okay. Under local control, that is not A, because under local control, there is a control operator. B, under automatic control, the control operator is not required to be present at the control point. I'm thinking it's going to be B, but let's go ahead and go back through the other ones again to be sure. Under automatic control, there is no control operator. Under local control, the control operator is not required to be present. I think it's going to be, I'm going to go with B. The wording of these two are a little bit odd. B and C seem both seem like they could be right, but somebody is ultimately responsible, and I think that would be the, considered the control operator. So I'm going to go with B. Under automatic control, the control operator is not required to be present at the control point. Okay. Uh, yeah, they were a little mixed in the chat room there. Most of them said B, though. The wording on B and C are, can kind of throw you a little bit. Yeah, I'm going to agree with you. I believe it is B as well. There you go. Oh, virtual fist bump. Yeah, not your elbow. Oh. Oh, with social distancing. There. There we go. <laughs> okay. Don't hit my sore elbow. <laughs> all right. <laughs> um, all right. Yeah, that. I mean, that makes sense there. Under local control, well, you know, you would think local control means there's somebody right there controlling it locally. So A doesn't make sense, does it? No. And the other one, the one you were really kind of concerned about is C, under automatic control, there is no control operator. But yeah, you got that. You reason that one out well there. There's always a control operator or somebody Some, ultimately responsible. Somebody's ultimately responsible for that station, and uh, he, that would be considered the control operator. Yeah. And C, under local control, a control operator is not required to be present at the control point. Well, it can't be under local control if there's nobody controlling it. If there's nobody locally? Yeah, yeah, that's kind of a trick one right there. Yep. Okay, well, why don't you ask me one? I think I will. How about this one? Okay. When may an automatically controlled station originate third-party communications? A, never. B, only when transmitting RIDI or data emissions. C, when agreed upon by the sending or receiving station. Or D, when approved by the National Telecommunications and Information Administration. When may an automatically controlled station originate third-party communications? Hmm. I'll start at the bottom. When approved by the National Telecommunications and Information Administration. Now, you, I mean, that sounds official, but... No, it, that's not it. C, when agreed upon by the sending and receiving station. Mm, no, I don't think that's right either, because if it's automatically controlled um, and it's third party, the sending station is not originating it. It's... Um, B, only when transmitting radio data communications. No, you know, that's that's not right. It's a, you know, an automatically controlled station can never originate third-party communications. It's always got to be uh, an operator who's doing that. Uh, that's that's my logic there. What do you think, Dean? I would I would concur with that. And uh, for the most part, the chat room does. 
Let's see. There. Never. So, easy enough on that one. Well, let me see if I can... So, what is, uh, just so for the... What is third-party communications? Although, if you're made it the extra, you should probably know that by now, but... Yeah, well, third-party communications, that is... Two-party communication is where there's two people there. There's me on one end of the conversation or transmission, and there's you on the other end. And that's two parties. Now, third-party uh, communications would mean there's somebody else. It's not either one of us is originating, That's uh, what they're saying there, originating a communication. Well... No, because, you know, when it's automatically controlled, there can only be one end or the other. And, and normally, third-party communications, one of us would be relaying that information. Yeah, on behalf of someone else. Yeah. No, automatically controlled, no. you. And third-party communications is generally, that's somebody who's not a ham. You're just passing along information for somebody because you are a ham and have authority to do it but um you know that third party just can't grab a microphone and start talking without a license or identifying or anything like that so right okay well good one oh can you run around to the other side of the room <laughs> I was going to give you an elbow bump there, but uh, okay. okay. <laughs> what is the maximum permissible duration of a remotely controlled station's transmission if its control link malfunctions? Is it A, 30 seconds? Ooh. Uh, B, three minutes. C, Five minutes. Or D, ten minutes. And this one's mine, isn't it? Mm -hmm. What is the maximum permissible duration of a remotely controlled station's transmissions? If it malfunctions, I guess so. If it's just sending dead air or noise or something like that. Yeah. 30 seconds. I mean, you don't want that to go on for very long, obviously. No. But 30 seconds seems awful short to even know. Three minutes, five. Ten, I don't think it's 10 minutes. Pretty sure it's going to be between B and C. I'm going to guess it's going to be B, three minutes. Okay. Let's see what they're saying over in the chat room. Uh, that's what they're saying in the chat room. I'm going to agree with you because that's kind of. I don't. I, yeah, I don't know why that's it, but uh, that's that's just what I kind of reason out. Yeah, well, it's in the rules, and so that's why it's three minutes. And I, you know, I kind of remember this back from the technician days, because on a repeater. How long before you time it out? If it's if the repeater is set for the maximum length of timeout, you got three minutes to say what you got to say, and then the repeater's going to shut oh. off. Yeah, and that that actually ran ran through my mind when I was thinking about that. Yeah. Usually, you got to let off the key and let it reset. To go yeah. much past that. So if something, you know, some kind of interference keyed up that repeater, the longest. It could keep the repeater transmitting would be three minutes. So, yeah. Makes sense. And you, you know, I was hoping you would make me regret not pulling the buzzer out tonight, but you've, you <laughs> well, know. Well, the night's still young. Yeah. So far, no satisfaction on that one. Uh, so, well, uh, don't give up. There's always hope. Okay. Which of the following types of communications may be transmitted to amateur stations in foreign countries. A, business-related messages for nonprofit organizations. 
C, oh, excuse me, I, I was jumping ahead there. B, messages intended for users of Maritime Satellite Service. C, communications incidental to the purpose of the amateur service and remarks of a personal nature. Or D, all of these choices are correct. It's not D, all of those are not correct. If we look at A, business-related messages for nonprofit organizations. Now, you know, you can't do business on amateur radio. So. Well, you know, whether it's money or not. Yep, whether it's a full profit or not. B, messages intended for users of maritime satellite service. No, in amateur radio, we're not allowed to broadcast. And that means where you're sending out messages to uh, to a wide audience only for them to listen and for people that are not hams you're sending out information you know that that non hams would would receive like a maritime uh, um, satellite receiver you know somebody who's on a boat but there may not be a ham so it's it's not that and Actually, it is C, communications incidental to the purpose of the amateur service and remarks of a personal nature. Now, that one always kind of throws me off a little bit when it says and remarks of a personal nature. I'm thinking, wait a minute. <laughs> but, but, yeah, I believe that's it. I believe it's C. Yeah. But you've seen that phrase before. Yeah. Um, and most... I think most people, by the time they've made it up to working on their extra ticket, they've probably seen that. Uh, even that same similar phrase was in the technician stuff about not doing business, you know, on the amateur bands and stuff, and that it's intended for uh, technical and, and uh, communications and things more personal. Yep. So, uh, no buzzer yet. No buzzer yet, but... No. That was pretty simple. Like I say, the night's still young. We're going to work on that. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Well, let's try it with this next one right here. What is meant by IARP? Is it A, an international amateur radio permit that allows U.S. amateurs to operate in certain countries of the Americas? Or B, the International Amateur Radio Practices Policy of the FCC. RC, an indication of increased antenna reflected power. Or D, a forecast of intermittent aurora radio propagation. That sounds important, but it's, but it's not it. I actually happen to know this one, at least I'm pretty sure I do, because when I was going... Up to Canada, I kind of looked this up when I was going to, when I went up there to see, you know, well, I went up to work, but I was busy with Mike at the same time. But I think the answer is going to be A, an international amateur radio permit that allows U.S. amateurs to operate in certain countries of the Americas. So that's going to be, that's my answer, and I'm sticking to it, A, Alpha. And you know they were they were kind of stumped on that one in the chat room. I have to be honest, I was kind of when I first read the question. Reciprocal agreement by country. You see the yellow there, and you see the green. The yellow is IARP member nations down in Central America, and then in the green up there, U.S. and Canada Treaty CEP and IARP. In the green area there, the U.S. and Canada, you know, we've got a treaty between our two countries. And then we also, you know, have the SEPT and IARP agreements and permits as well. Also, see that little sliver of orange there? That's members of SEP and IARP. And the red SEP member nations, I don't even know that we should talk about that yet because I think we're going to talk about it real soon. So maybe I shouldn't have showed you this information just yet. Oh, yeah. I'm making a mental picture here. Yeah, that's a scary thought. If I remember it by then, it would be a miracle. Well, then why don't you ask me this one? Okay. I think I will. 
Which of the following is required in order to operate in accordance with CEPT rules in foreign countries where permitted? A. You must identify in the official language of the country in which you're operating. B. The U.S. Embassy must approve of your operation. Or C. You must bring a copy of the FCC Public Notice DA-16-1048. Or D. You must append slash CEPT to your call sign. That's, this is a tough one here. This is a tough one, and I was... You know, when you flip that coin at the beginning there, you should have called it the other way. Because <laughs> if you're going to miss one, this is probably going to be it right here. Uh, looking at the chat room. Oh, yeah. they're all. Don't look at the chat room. They're, they're you, a little you have to mixed make on. your answer. Well, I mean, they're. They're not a lot of help. They've guessed. Not to, not on this one, they're not. They're AC all over the place, and D, too. And then there was also thinking it's B or C. And some of them are giving two answers. Yep. What are we going to need? Well, I don't think we have to tell the U.S. Embassy and get their approval. You must identify in the official language of the country in which you're operating. You'd almost think that's it. You must append... Yeah, I don't think so. Slash SEP to your call sign. Now, nah. it is uh, C. You must bring a copy of FCC Public Notice DA 16 1048. I think that's the answer. What do you think? Yeah, I, th I think so too. There you go. Um, what did they say over in the chat room? Most of them said C. So, yeah, more got it than I thought would. Here's something Instead. about the SEPT agreement. This is actually public notice DA 16-1048. You see there in the yellow one, operating an amateur station in a CEPT country. The person must have in his or her possession a copy of this public notice, proof of U.S. citizenship, and evidence of the FCC license grant. These documents must be shown to the proper authorities upon request. That says it all right there. Pretty much sums it up. Mm -hmm. Now for that question that I promised you. Which of the following operator agreements allows a FCC licensed U.S. citizen to operate in many European countries and alien amateurs from many European countries to operate in the U.S.? A, a SEPT agreement, CEPT. B, an IARP agreement. C, ITU reciprocal license. Or D, all of these choices are correct. So, thinking back about the mental note I made of the map about two slides back, which of the following operating agreements show FCC license U.S. is operating in many European countries? and European countries to operate in the U.S. I think that's going to be a, a SEPT agreement or CEPT agreement. I'm going to say you may just be right. Most people in the chat room are saying A. If you wouldn't have put that map up there, I might not have been right. Well, that's what but I was I saying. To thank you for that. Yeah, that's what I was saying. I shouldn't have put it up there. I was, you know, I should have held it till right now to show it. You would have made me work for it a little harder, that's for sure. Yep, probably would have. I know it would me. You going to the snack bar? I think I am going to go to the snack bar. I'll meet yeah. you there. Okay. From six feet, six feet away. Hey, Mom. Yes, you. Why fuss and fret about dinner? Why not have it right here? Yes, this drive-in offers everyone in the family a real picnic treat for dinner. We've got delicious sandwiches with all the trimmings and your other dinner favorites, plus whatever you want to drink, hot or cold. Come early before the show starts, or eat while you're being entertained, or at intermission time. So why fuss? Give your family a tasty dinner at this drive-in. Get out and be active with ICOM's new IC705 and its optional multifunction backpack. The IC705 is your perfect QRP companion as you have base station features and functionality 
at the tips of your fingers in a portable package covering HF 6 meters, 2 meters, and 70 centimeters. This compact rig weighs in at 1 kilo, or just over 2 pounds. With RF direct sampling for most of the HF band and IF sampling for frequencies above 25 megahertz. 5 watt battery operation with BP272 or 10 watts with a 13.8 volt DC supply. Modes include single sideband, CW, AM, FM, as well as full D star functions. A large 4.3 inch color touchscreen and live band scope with waterfall. Integrated GPS with antenna and GPS logger, micro SD card for data storage, it comes standard with the HM243 speaker microphone, and it supports QRP and QRPP operations. The perfect accessory for the IC705 is the LC192 optional backpack, with a special compartment for your IC705 and room for accessories for soda activations or just a day in the park. Visit icomamerica.com amateur for more information about this and all the great ICOM radios. I don't want to give away a shirt. You know, that is a most excellent idea. And I was just waiting for you to say that. <laughs> um, well, it was just right there. I was just thinking about it. Some, something brought it to the forefront of my mind. Imagine that. Uh, you know, speaking of shirts. Do you have it? I, I have a shirt, a shirt right here. And the reason have- I wore this shirt tonight is because I knew some of these questions are going to be tough, and I wanted the extra brain power on my side. There you go. So, Not a bad idea. No, not a bad idea. But. We're giving away a shirt. Well, let me rephrase that. ICOM's going to give away a shirt and a hat to some lucky amateur and whatever else Jesse stuff's in the box there. If you'd like to win that, what would you do? Yeah, you send an email to hamcollege at amateurlogic.tv. If you want to put a little note in there, you can, but it's not required. We just need a name. And uh, that's all you need, the name. And then uh, ICOM will get in touch with the winner to get the shirt size and get make the arrangements to ship it to you. A name and an email Pretty, address. A name and an email address. Pretty much everybody's got that. Yeah. And you don't. Don't need a call sign, anything else special. And we, we draw from those entries we get each month, and we pick out uh, one winner there, a random drawing. And then we discard all the entries. So you'll want to enter again each month. Only enter once during the month. And, you know, your turn could come up. As a matter of fact, we've got a lucky winner here tonight whose turn came up. And you spoke of uh, a little note that you can put in there. And that's what he did. He said, thank you, 7-3. Todd Farrell. That's a little note, but it's sufficient. Todd Farrell, WE5TR. Well, congrats, Todd. Yeah, congratulations, Todd. You're going to be rocking a new ICOM Ham Crew t-shirt, as well as a, a new ICOM ball cap as well. And whatever else Jesse stuffs in the box, as we said. So Yeah, probably a good chance there'll probably be some other goodies in there, I would, I would imagine. Yeah, so uh, the rest of you watching here, just drop us a note to Ham College at AmateurLogic.tv, and you you might be uh, the person who gets your name called out next month. And we'll even throw in a shirt and a hat from from ICOM as well. Good luck in the contest. And thanks ICOM for sponsoring Ham College and for making a prize available there. And to the next questions here. This one you were going to ask me. Uh, I still will. Uh, Looking at this one, I'm glad this one's going to you. What is the maximum bandwidth for data transmission? Or, I'm sorry. What is the maximum bandwidth for a data emission on 60 meters? A, 60 hertz. B, 170 hertz. 
C, 1.5 kilohertz. Or D, 2.8 kilohertz. Well, what is the maximum bandwidth for a data emission on 60 meters? 60 meters, that's that 5 megahertz band we got a few years back here. Channelized. Yes, it's broken up in channels. Yep, and you got certain uh, restrictions as to the amount of effective radiated power. I believe that's that's the way they classified it there. Um, and, and several restrictions on there. A data emission, well, that could be... Well, that could be a lot of... There's a lot of different data modes. Um... So if you can even do data on on the 60-meter um, band, I'm going to say you can do D, 2.8 kilohertz of data, because I know you're allowed that kind of bandwidth uh, for doing sideband. Obviously, you couldn't do sideband with 60, 170, and not very well with 1.5 kilohertz. It's 2.8 kilohertz is allowed there in each of those channels. So I'm going to say, yeah, 2.8 kilohertz. What do you think? Yeah, that seems that seems plausible. I, I don't know if that's the answer, but I think that would probably be right. You want this? I'll take that. Uh, doesn't 60 meters only allow CW and data? Uh... That is a very good question. You know, I thought maybe. No, I'm pretty sh no, I'm pretty sure that I've heard voice contacts on there before. Well, I, I have I have made voice contacts on there, so I know it allows a sideband. Let's see what it does allow. Uh, there's the uh, U.S. Amateur Radio Band chart right there from AR. Oh, that was handy. It was, wasn't it? Let's zoom in on it. <laughs> 60 meters, the 5.3 megahertz band there. And you can see what I said, 2.8 kilohertz. Each of those little slices there, or channels, are 2.8 kilohertz wide. We know that part is right. Permitted operating modes include upper side band voice, CW, RIDI, PSK31, and other digital modes such as Pactor 3. Only one signal at a time is permitted on any channel. Everything you want to know about the 60-meter band. It's been years since I tried to operate there. I probably ought to go back over there, but it was a pretty good band. The best yeah. I remember, you know, that it was a pretty good band. So, Yeah, uh, it wasn't real crowded. No, it, it wasn't real crowded, but you would... You generally find some traffic on there, so that's mm -hmm. you know that's good. When the other bands weren't doing much, it it seemed to do pretty decent. So, one to keep in mind there. Okay, I've got a question for you. At what level below a signal's mean power level is its bandwidth determined according to FCC rules? A three dB. B, 6 dB. C, 23 dB. Or D, 26 dB. Remember that uh, thing when you wanted to switch the way the coin flipped before? Can we go back and do that now? It's too late now. You wouldn't take my offer. I'm probably going to be there's some buzzing going on here. At what level below? You can go ahead and get it and get the big battery because you're going to need it. <laughs> Um, at what level below a signal's mean power level is its bandwidth determined according to FCC rules? I, I don't even know. who. I'm just going to have to guess, man. And I, and I don't even know. I, I do, don't even know. Do you even know what they're asking? I don't know. I'm not sure I fully understand the question. Do you want me to? I know they're asking about the bandwidth, so I'm the mean power level. I guess that's the peak. They are asking how, how, how much signal you've got before you can determine how much the bandwidth. You want you want is. me to so, do some splaining? 
Yeah, you can explain it if you want to. Even see that? You can't even see that, can you? Yeah, I see it. Okay. Well, this is say this is a signal that say you're seeing on a, on your spectrum scope. And right here. Yeah. Okay. The or, peak. The peak right here. You could determine your mean power level. You know, it's it's going to be determined by how much power. That's the peak in it right there. So mm -hmm. you would determine what the the mean power level was, and that would be a certain number of dB. So let's say you you call that zero dB. Somewhere below the the mean power level, there's going to be um, a, a point, and I. I'm not going to say where it is, but somewhere below there, a certain number of dB below zero, everything that's, you know, above that, they're going to call part of your bandwidth. So they want to know how many dB down from, from where mean power level is, would they consider it part of your bandwidth and then disregard, you know, the rest of it, you know, off to the sides there. Did okay. That, did that help any? Yeah, but I still don't know what the answer is. Well, three dB. Well, that's that's a double. I'm gonna guess it's gonna be C. I uh, I'm just guessing. I I really don't know. We gotta have some buzzer action going on around here, don't we? Is a, is a meal in there? It'll be his lucky night. D. It was tough. I, I knew it wasn't 3 dB or 6 dB. I knew it was way more than that. Yeah, that didn't that didn't seem right, but 26, 26 seemed like an awful lot. I just, like I said, I was guessing. I didn't. I obviously didn't know. You can go ahead and throw one so it'll be even. What is the highest modulation index permitted at the highest modulation frequency for angle modulation below 29 megahertz? A, 0.5. B, 1.0. C, 2.0. Or D, 3.0. Hmm, what is the highest modulation index permitted at the highest modulation frequency for angle modulation below 29 megahertz? I'm going to say it's B, 1.0. I'm thinking it was B2, and I'm not sure why. But I'm thinking that means 100% modulation, but I, I don't remember. I may be getting my stuff mixed up. Yeah, this one's going to take some explaining for sure. Because first thing we've got to do is figure out what the heck do they mean by angle modulation. It's B, 1.0. So let's talk about what angle modulation is. Angle modulation is a class of carrier modulation that is used in telecommunications transmission systems. The class comprises frequency modulation and phase modulation and is based on altering the frequency or the phase, respectively, of a carrier signal to encode the message signal. There, when they say angle modulation, they're talking about either frequency modulation or phase modulation, which which those two are are very similar, you know. But frequency modulation is changing that frequency a lot, you know. Phase modulation is just changing the phase of it, uh, you know, slightly changing the frequency of it, but not, I mean, ju just so little that it's only the phase of it. So angle modulation could be either one of those two. So now that gives us a little more information about it. Still doesn't tell us why it's 1.0. And I'm not sure I can even tell you that, but I can tell you what the modulation index is. Okay. It's the modulation depth of a modulation scheme described how much the modulated variable of the carrier signal varies around its unmodulated level. It's defined differently in each modulation scheme for amplitude, modulation index, frequency modulation index, or phase modulation index. 
That's your ham college infomercial for the evening. There you go. That's a little history lesson there, more than you wanted. Sort of. Okay, I got one for you. What is a permitted... Oh, not another one of these. (laughs) Yeah, that coin landed right. What is the permitted mean power of any spurious emission relative to the mean power of the fundamental emission from a station transmitting or external RF amplifier installed after January 1st, 2003, and transmitting on a frequency below 30 megahertz. Is it A, at least 43 dB below? Wow. B, at least 53 dB below. C, at least 63 dB below. Or D, at least 73 dB below. You know, and this is one of those that I'm, I'm kind of glad that I left you the opportunity to answer. Are you? Yeah, I'm yeah, very because there's going to be some buzzing <laughs> going on. Yeah, this is nothing like Unless 26. Unless I get real lucky. Yeah. What is the permitted mean power of any spurious emission? Yeah, and I volunteered to do this to myself too, man. <laughs> uh, any spurious emission <laughs> relative to the mean power of the fundamental emission from a station transmitter or external RF amplifier installed after January the 21st, 2003. What what time on January the 1st would that have to be? Midnight? Yeah. I didn't know if it was going to be a morning or an afternoon thing, whatever. Well, I don't, I don't think they're really trying to narrow down things much on this question. <laughs> <laughs> the other one was in the 20s that I seem like a lot. I want to guess I'm going to guess the lower one A. I, I just I just don't know. Okay. I, I honestly don't I have no idea. Well, your old guesser has been correct before. But although, not this time. Yeah, although it failed you a moment ago. It yeah. it could pull it off for you this time. Let's see. There you go. Your guesser worked. You better lock it down right there. Well, that's. A, I'm gonna go buy a lottery ticket when I get through with this show. <laughs> before midnight. It's okay. my lucky day. Um. Where was I explaining a while ago? This is different. And, and I realize it's a diff, whole different question. Yeah. But I'm just saying that it... Like, we were talking about this a while ago. You know, yeah. the... Uh, and and those points there, that's just describing what do they call the bandwidth. A, right. A spur is going to be something, you know, that pops up somewhere else outside of the bandwidth. You know, a little peak. Right. That's being generated. So, yeah, it's got to be lower. And in 43, that's a... That's it, man. That was a good guess. I think there was some skill involved there. Let's take one more quick break because we got a few more questions to go. We got a little more explaining to do. Are you new to the ham world or an existing amateur operator who wants to take your license to the next level? Study for your radio license exam at hamstudy.org. Hamstudy.org is a free online learning tool powered by ICOM. It was created by Richard Bateman, KD7BBC, Michael Stuffelbean, KV9G, and Rich Porter, KK6GKE, and it uses a modern web design to enhance the experience of studying for your technician, general, and amateur extra exams. Since 2013, hamstudy.org has helped new and existing hams to familiarize themselves with the question pools, use stats-based flashcards to focus on material they need to learn, and take practice exams to gauge progress. Visit hamstudy.org on your desktop computer or mobile device. Register for a free account at hamstudy.org to access personalized study history 
and other sight features. Prepare for an exam in an intuitive and comprehensive manner. Check out hamstudy.org powered by ICOM for free learning tools. Good luck on your next exam. Hamstudy.org, that's the uh, founder of that guy that was with us last month. So be sure and go check out that interview we had with him. Yeah, very, uh, very good information there. Well, why don't you ask me the next one here tonight? I'm going to have to, man, because I don't think I could do two in a row like that. Okay, on what portion of the 630-meter band are phone emissions permitted? A, none. B, only the top 3 kilohertz. C, only the bottom 3 kilohertz. Or D, the entire band. On what portion of the 630-meter band... Are phone emissions permitted? Let's see, 630 meters. Wow, it would be helpful to know if we, you know, what permissions we do have on that. We'll look at that in a moment. But I got to come up with an answer. Only the top three kilohertz? Three kilohertz is not very much. Mm. Only the bottom three kilohertz. 3 kilohertz, that's like one sideband transmission. Yeah. RD, the entire band. Well, I'm not exactly sure how wide the 630 meter band even is. It just depends on what, what permissions, um, you know, were granted there. So I'm going to say... I'm going to say I believe we can operate phone emissions on that band. And I know the band's not very big, so I'm going to say it's the entire band. Let's see what's chat room. I think I think that's right, because if you reason that out, I'm it's, it's got to either be A or D. And I'm almost sure there was phone allowed on there. Um, and 3 kilohertz, that, like I said, that's, that's basically just one single sideband transmission. It is. Yeah. So, I mean, you know it's got to have more than one talking on it at a time. Or, I mean, you would think. It just about has to be either A or D, and I'm almost sure that it had phone transmissions on there. Okay. Well, let's see. And that's, and that's the world according to Tommy right there. Okay. And that's the answer according to George. The entire you nailed it. Yep. <laughs> and let's let's look at it. I mean, we kind of, you know, it'd be helpful if we had a band chart well, hanging around. Well, we kind of got to now. Well, we kind of do. You know, there was a question in the chat room: What the heck is the six hundred and thirty meter band? Well, that's the four hundred and seventy two kilohertz wow. band. Well, it's only 7 kilohertz wide. If you were going to do phone transmission there, you're almost taking up the whole band. And taking half of it. Yep. And if you look at the bars there that are shown under 630 meters, red indicates ready. Ready in data. Yep. And green indicates phone or image. And extra advanced and general can use that band. And that's a new band, so that's the reason you may not be familiar with it. We haven't had permissions there very long. There's another uh, newer band that we got permissions on around the same time. I promised you one more question for tonight, and I'm, I want you to know I'm, I deliver on my promises. What notifications <laughs> must be given before transmitting on the 630 meter or the 2200 meter bands. A, a special endorsement must be requested from the FCC. B, an environmental impact statement must be filed with the Department of the Interior. C, operators must inform the Utilities Technology Council, UTC, of their call sign and coordinates of the station. D, Operators must inform the FAA of their intent to operate 
giving their call sign and distance to the nearest runway. It's not a special endorsement. I'm pretty sure that uh, it's going to be C. The operators must inform the Utilities Technologies Council or the UTC of their call sign and the coordinates of the station. Well, let's see. This is new stuff, so. It totally redeemed yourself. We read we read that somewhere before. It was probably, uh, yeah. We gave them one question last time, and this was probably the one. I'm going to tell you there is a a question in, or an answer in there that was kind of designed to mislead you, I believe. The first one there, a special endorsement must be requested from the FCC. I believe before the rules officially changed on this, that you did have to request with the FCC to uh, allow you to operate on that band, or you had to notify the FCC or something. But now you got to tell the utility companies because they're possibly using the 630 meters or the you know 2200 meters for some of their stuff. Bring the chart back up one more time. Amateurs wishing to operate on either 2200 or 630 meters must first register with the Utilities Technology Council online at blah, blah, blah. You need to register once for each band. It's in the top left corner. Emil saw it. Thank, thanks, Emil. Okay. Totally redeemed me. That was the cheap thing of him to do. Didn't cost him <laughs> anything. <laughs> and, and you had already given the right answer, so. How long must an operator wait after filing a notification with the Utilities Technology Council or the UTC before operating on the 2200 meter or 630 meter band? A, operators must not operate until approval is received. B, operators may operate after 30 days providing they have not been told that their station is within one kilometer of PLC systems using those frequencies. C. Operators may not operate until a test signal has been transmitted in coordination with the local power company. Or D. Operations may commence immediately and may continue unless interference is reported by the UTC. I'm going to say uh, you got to notify them that you're going, uh, you, you want to transmit on in that band because they might have something going on there. And yeah, they just want to make sure it's coordinated. It doesn't interfere with the utilities. So. I'm going to say operators may operate after 30 days, providing they have not been told uh, their station is within one kilometer of PLC systems using those frequencies. Uh, one kilometer, that's, you know, that's uh, not real long. I don't remember how many feet that is, but... Uh, roughly a half a mile. If they don't say anything in 30 days, it's every man for himself. Well, or at least the person or the ham who, who filed notification with them. Now, you know, if if they don't notify you and then later you're causing interference, yeah, something, you know, might need to be done then. But, yeah, if, if you haven't heard from them in 30 days, you're you're good to go, I believe. Yep. Chat room? Yep. Most of them guessed B. Uh, well, some of them guessed B. Most of them didn't guess anything. So um, that was a safe bet right there. But Yeah. yeah you know, well, this, is all, this is new stuff right here. So It is. This is all new stuff because we haven't had these bands that long. Well, that's all the questions for tonight. And we got that. didn't hurt much. Pretty easy, yeah. Only one, one buzzer, so that's not too bad. This guy, this guy, and I'm proud of you. Let me just say that, you know, somebody needs to do it, just so we can can maintain uh, order. 
<laughs> or that's what you call it. Yeah. I don't remember what the question was. Now it was a toughie though. They've been having a good time in the chat room there, amateurlogic.tv slash chat. So when you're live, you know, you can watch that while you're watching the live stream too and see what folks are talking about in there. And on this show, they're mostly talking about the same things that we are. They're answering the questions and throwing out uh, comments about them. You won't only get the right answer. Sometimes they'll throw in the wrong one. For no extra charge. So. <laughs> okay, and one other thing. During the month, you know, where might you catch up with us? Well, we're usually on most of the social media outlets. We've got a Facebook group, uh, facebook.com slash groups slash ham college. And we also have slash amateur logic. Uh, and you can uh, follow us at ham college on Twitter or at Amateur Logic. Yep, and we also have a, a really nice uh, groups IO group. It's uh, groups.io slash g slash Amateur Logic. And a lot of people aren't into the Facebook thing. and Some people don't like Twitter, but this is more like uh, an old school mail list, really. And uh, you don't have to really go check on anything. Once you sign up for it, you can set up and get a a digest once a day, or you can get individual emails sent to you as they happen live. And it's not a lot of traffic, so it's a, it's a nice option for people that uh, want to know when we're going to go live, have these live streams and yep. contests. And whatever whatever we have, we try to share it on there as well. Yeah, and that's mostly what's on there is when, when we're going to do a live stream, when a new show has been posted. Things like that that, uh, you know, you probably want to know if uh, if you're following the show. Yeah, it's a good way to get it emailed to you. And as Tommy said, you can go ahead and, and tell it to send you every email because you're not going to get spammed. There's not, you know. It, there's it's not a lot of traffic. It's just, no. just the right amount, if you ask just me. Just the right amount, yeah. It does exactly what we wanted it to, and that's to let people know. So... There you yeah, go. It's been a good resource. It has been. Well, a f fun and interesting show tonight. A lot of uh, questions, a lot of some tough ones. Tonight's questions, I don't think we even said what they were before we started. They were from E1C, rules pertaining to automatic and remote control, band specific regulations operating in and communicating with foreign countries, spurious emission standards, HF modulation index limits, and bandwidth definition. And, you know, if we had really read that before the questions tonight, we might have had a lot of people leave because that's some tough, tough things there, you know. Yeah, that was a good plan not to read that until the end. Yep. Yeah, well, it wasn't really a plan. It's just that uh, it just didn't happen. So well, I was just trying to. Well, I was trying to cover for you, but you just wouldn't let me. Well, you know, uh, you you being Mister Honesty and all, we we don't want to give you a bad rep. But anytime you want to cover for me, that's okay. You know, we we <laughs> won't right. count that against you. Well, thanks for being here, everyone. Join us again at the end of next month, the end of, what month is it? June. Field Day is coming up at the end of June. It'll be kind of different this year. It is going to be kind of different. Don't really know what's going to go on there yet. The ARRL is, is kind of recommending that people don't gather. They have changed some of the rules uh, just for this year only so that uh, you can operate from home and and count the contacts with other home stations a couple of couple of amendments made to the rules uh just for this year you know may not be that way next year but for I, this year I, I hope it's not like that next year i do too so we don't know what we're going to do yet i told ray earlier that cuz he had been asking 
So I don't know. I, I gave him some bad information earlier. I had my months mixed up. So I don't know. Maybe we can uh, do some social distancing field day. But yet, uh, do a show with it as well. So, I don't know. We'll we'll have to see what kind of creative solution we can come up with on that. Yeah, we'll figure we'll figure something out. I guarantee you, we'll do something. Might be wrong, but it'll be something. Well, it'll be right on track then. <laughs> All right, well, seven three, everyone, and uh, don't forget Amateur Logic around the middle of this month. Only a couple of weeks away. And we're going to have another good show there. I don't know what Tommy is going to have going on, but he's going to tell me when we hang up the phone here in just a second. No, uh, that's not for this one. I've already got this month's segment sitting out there on the server. The one I'm going to show you in a minute is going to be for the next one. Oh, okay. Well, there you go. Listen. You know you've got at least two more months of really good shows coming up that Tommy's ahead of the curve on. So I got I got some catching up to do. Yeah, I've been trying to get a couple ahead, so uh, when I start back to traveling for work, I won't have such a time because I'm fun I have a funny feeling when it starts back, it's going to be full on for a bit. So. Yeah. yeah. All right. All right. Seventy three, everybody. Appreciate you joining us. And insert your favorite blooper here. One more, and then we'll take a little break, I promise. All right. Well, well, why don't you just show me something about the SEPT agreement in the other countries? B, an IARP agreement? How do you pronounce that? AARP. <laughs> I have no idea. I've never heard it pronounced. 